Well, most technical analysis is reactive. That is, if you look at a moving average, it's telling you what has happened in the past. And of course, when you're trading, you're trading off the right-hand side into the future. So you need to have a model of the market that is not reactive, but rather is predictive in nature. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there and welcome to Better System Trader. This is episode number 103 and today we're going to be talking about indicators or specifically a brand new indicator. Indicators often form a large part of trading systems. However, there are a number of issues that are caused by indicators that can, can result in underperforming trading strategies. They're reactive instead of predictive. They have a lot of lag, which means they're very slow to respond at times, and they can often give you a signal too late, so you've already missed some of the move. Today, we're going to talk to John Ellers, who will be sharing with us a brand new indicator that he's developed that overcomes a lot of these issues. And uh, th this new indicator minimizes lag. It's very responsive to the market, and it can give you a fast indication of turning points. Plus, at the end of the chat today, we'll share with you how you can get a free copy of this new indicator because John's going to uh, share it with us so you can download it and try it out for yourself. So let's get straight into this chat with John Ellers. Hi, John. Welcome and thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew. It's a bright, sunny day here in California. Oh, excellent. So um, you've uh, obviously been on the podcast before a couple of times, so it's really great to uh, have you on here again. I believe you're even going to discuss a new type of indicator as well, which is really exciting. So I'm uh, quite pumped to get into that today. Um, but for people who perhaps didn't catch uh, the earlier podcast episodes we did with you, do you want to just give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself and um, how you got into trading? Sure. I'm, I'm a, an electrical engineer. Um, I did my doctorate work in uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and I majored in fields and waves and minored in information theory. And in the course of my engineering work, I came across uh, the mathematical process called Maximum Entropy Spectrum Analysis, or MESA, and I found that that was very useful for trading as opposed to Fourier transforms because it only uses a short amount of data to measure the cycles in the market. And uh, so that gave me a leg up, and that's really how I got into trading. And um, any casual observer of, of data can see the cycles that are present there, but l most traders don't use them because, number one, they're ephemeral, and number two, the mathematics to work with them is a little difficult. And uh, so I decided to focus on the cycles in the market and, um, and use that in my trading. And that's been very successful for me. I think, uh, so I went to your workshop last year and I've read a number of your books and I think that um, your approach to the markets through cycles and DSP is, is quite unique. So why do you think it's important to look at the markets in that type of a way? Well, I think most technical analysis um, is reactive. That is, if you look at a moving average, it's, it's telling you what has happened in the past. And of course, when you're trading, you're trading off the right-hand side into the future. And, and so you need to have a model of the market uh, that is not reactive, but rather is um, predictive in nature. And that's where cycles come in. Because if you can see a cycle uh, that is present in, in the recent data and have enough knowledge about um, the characteristics of that cycle, you can extrapolate it into the future so it becomes a predictive model. And your hope is that, that um, 
that cycle will continue long enough for you to take advantage of it in, in your position. And that seems to have worked out. Um, I found through my research that um, the kind of trading that you do with this model, this predictive model, is um, a swing trading or reversion to the mean. That is, I can sense when the cycle is near a maximum or a minimum. If it's at a minimum, that's uh, the time to buy. In fact, I want to anticipate uh, that because uh, there's lag in all calculations. And so you want to negate the necessary computational lag that you have. So uh, it's important to avoid the lag and important to have a predictive model when you do your trading. Yeah, so I think um, you've kind of just touched on one of the, the key problems with indicators there is the lag. But I think it's it's quite important to recognize, um, especially because indicators can play a big part in trading strategies, it's uh, important to understand uh, some of the problems with, with indicators. So can you give us a bit more information on the types of issues that we can see by um, uh, when using indicators? Well, let me try this. Uh, there is a persistent uh, one-month cycle or 20 trading day cycle in in uh, um, most stocks and in the index futures. And so that means that in general terms, uh, your trading will have 10 days to the upside and 10 days to the downside in a typical cycle. So if you have um, um, a typical RSI calculation, uh, to make it useful, it might have something on the order of three bars of lag. Now, the typical process that you see in, in the literature is to use an RSI, you uh, wait for confirmation until after this, the indicator has made its turning point. So if you add up uh, all the lags involved, there's the three-day lag in com computing the RSI, then you've got another three days of a lag waiting for confirmation and then you get in on the next bar after that so in total you've got seven bars of lag and your total whole move is 10 days so you're you're seven days into a 10-day move in one direction and you're seven days into a 10-day move in the other direction you're past a 50 percent point adversely and so it's a guaranteed loser so the process um, is instead of waiting for confirmation, you really need to predict when that turning point is going to happen. So that cancel, in a sense, it cancels out your comp computational lag and you're in right at the exact time that the market makes its turn. So the anticipation um, to cancel out your computational lag is, is an important consideration uh, in my opinion. Yeah, so in that example you're talking about the RSI, I guess uh, it's common to use RSI with a um, you know in a small period of uh, bars. But what about things like a moving average is quite a, a common indicator to have, and and people can often use those up to two hundred periods. So I guess the the lag in those kind of uh, calculations is even longer, right? Yes, in fact, um, I you really can't use a moving average in a in a reversion type to the mean type strategy that's more for trend following so to create you need to create an oscillator now you can do that with a double moving average that's one way to create an oscillator but uh you can use stochastics or a variety of other uh, indicators uh, but the process is still about the same you use the in uh, a, an oscillator type uh, indicator and uh, and try to predict the turning point in advance of it happening. Yep. So uh, you just mentioned there that uh, you, perhaps you could use uh, multiple um, moving averages to come up with a oscillator. I understand you've done some work around the EMA to come up with a, a new type of indicator. So so can you explain a little bit about um, what you've been looking at? Sure. I, it's an exciting new indicator. It, it minimizes lag and very responsive. Um, and, and it's um, 
takes advantages of some of the characteristics of an EMA. EMA, of course, stands for Exponential Moving Average, and um, it has lag like all other uh, averages have. In fact, uh, it has distortion in, involved with it because the longer waves uh, are delayed more than the sh sh higher frequency or shorter wave periods. So um, to get around that distortion and those lags, one way of doing that, if, if you picture uh, a chart, a uh, price chart, and you take a moving average from left to right, an EMA, and that has a delay built into it, and then you take um, a moving average of that first moving average from right to left. Well, what you've done is cancel out all of the distortions and the lags. You have zero lag at all frequencies when you do that. And that would make a really, really nice indicator because it's perfect. It has no lag at any frequency. The only problem is you can't do that in real time because you're working uh, on the right-hand side of the chart. And so to make a reverse exponential moving average, uh, it's not realizable, or the mathematicians call it non-causal. So um, what I have done is, is noted some of the characteristics of, of an EMA, an exponential moving average. If it, it has an it's called an infinite impulse response. An impulse is just considered a spike. So if you put a spike into an exponential moving average, it'll put out a spike on the first sample. And the next sample, there's no input. And so the output is just a fraction of, of the moving average times the first spike. And the second output, there's still no input, and so the output is the fraction times the first fraction, or the fraction squared at the second sample. The third sample is, takes the second sample and applies the fraction again, so the coefficient for that term is um, the fraction cubed, and so on. And so the sample size decays exponentially, and that's why they call it an exponential moving average. So these coefficients, um, if you look at them, they, if you go out long enough, uh, the, they become infinitesimally small. And so you can convert a, a, uh, an infinite impulse response. You can just cut it off and truncate it into a finite series. So it becomes a finite impulse response. Well, by, do, by making it a finite impulse response, you can place it at the right-hand side of your chart, reverse this, the characteristics of the, to go from right to left, reverse the characteristics of the uh, EMA and put in enough lag to make it realizable, and you have a calculated reverse EMA. So I do that, and once you have done that, you've created a, a moving average um, that is free of all of these distortions, uh, but it's still, there's one more step. The original EMA has distortions in it, but it turns out that's the very thing you want to look at when you're looking at, at an oscillator. So if you subtract this reverse EMA, the one that goes right and to the left from the original EMA, you have a really, really nice um, oscillator type indicator that is very reactive uh, to all the distortions in the market. And that's uh, what I've done with this reverse EMA indicator. Mm. Uh, before we get to um, the applications of this, I just wanted to jump back to a statement you made about um, cutting off or, or a point where you can cut it off because the the um, or the spike is is such a small value that it's negligible. So how do you determine where that cutoff should be? It varies because of the size of the uh, uh, EMA fraction. If if you have a um, a very long EMA. It's going to take a long time 
for that to decay. You might want to decay that over maybe 100 units or 100 samples. Um, you will always have error uh, no matter what. But uh, it's when, when the in, in round numbers, when it be, when the error term becomes a few percent, that's when you can stop. Okay. So let me just um, summarize to see if I've got this uh, indicator correct. So we're using uh, two EMAs. We're calculating one from left to right and one from right to left. Uh, the right to left one, we're, we're having some type of cutoff. And then we're looking at the differences between the two to create an oscillator. Is that essentially how it works? That's how it works. Okay, good. It's early in the morning here, so I just wanted to make sure I got my brain around it. So I haven't had my coffee yet. So what are the actual applications of having this type of a oscillator indicator? Like how can we use it in the markets? Well, since it's a reactive indicator, um, you can look at uh, when it reaches its peaks and valleys. That is, you can now look at the rate of change. Uh, to isolate uh, the major peaks and valleys and do and so when the rate of change crosses zero that's uh, the time you should have been in by that time um, you should have made your long or short entry say if it's at the valley and gets a the rate of change crosses from negative to positive uh, that would be an entry point under the condition uh, that the oscillator itself is larger than some threshold. Um, and those are generally experimentally determined. And so that becomes, you can go directly from the oscillator uh, to creating rules for your strategies of entries and exits based upon how that oscillator has reached its, I don't like the terms, but the typical Terminology is oversold and overbought. Okay, so that's a that's in a I guess a mean reversion type of uh, approach. But is there anything else that you can do with this indicator? Maybe trend following or something like that. I think its best application is um, reversion to the mean um, because you're taking a difference of basically the same EMA. Uh, you're guaranteed pretty much of of a uh, a zero value of the mean and so it makes it easy to assess when you have reached maximum departure from that mean in other words um, you want to take get as much of the movement under your belt as possible uh, from the negative swing maximum to the positive swing maximum yeah now, um, you've already kind of mentioned a couple of the benefits of this indicator, but I just wanted to ask you again. So um, you, what are the good things about using a, um, an indicator like this? It eliminates lag and takes advantage. Uh, it, it amplifies the distortion in the original EMA. That is, the long waves are delayed more than the short waves, and so the, that makes the indicator very reactive to the short waves and let the long waves uh, take their place in, in your indicator. That is, you get a fast indication of the turning point as a result of using this in indicator. Right. So you're saying that it's responsive all across the spectrum? Uh, yes. You can change its characteristic, of course, by changing... Uh, the fraction of the EMA, that is, it, it's, it's, it's parametric, just like an EMA is parametric on, on that fraction. Uh, the resulting, um, resulting indicator from using this reverse EMA is also, so you can make it, uh, uh, it, it it's, it's useful for uh, cyclic kind of trading, but if you slow it down, it's also useful um, to identify momentum trades, which I don't recommend. But uh, but there, there's uh, uh, beauty in it for everybody, and even trend traders. If you make it a long duration uh, kind of uh, moving average, then you can identify the longer trends also. It's just that I focus my own trading on on the fast reaction. Um, 
cycle kinds of trading or reversion to the mean. So how did you actually come up with this idea to um, try and cancel out the EMAs to uh, see what the result was? I ran across an article that talked about uh, a, a digital signal processing article that talked about how to, to in fact, make a uh, reverse um, infinite impulse filter. It was a more general filter, and I just simplified it down to make it apply to uh, an EMA. So it was in a technical article that I happened to be reading in the, in the process of my engineering work. All right. Well, I understand that you're actually going to make this um, indicator or the code for this indicator available for download. I have. In fact, uh, you have it, uh, and uh, I, I think you're going to put it up on your website. I sure am. Thank you very much for that. So I'll um, put that up on the show notes page, and you can download that indicator, and uh, you can go and try that and try building some strategies with it and see how it performs. So uh, just go to the show notes page for that one. Um, now, also, John, I understand you're um, having your workshop again this year. Um, I attended last year, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic and uh, learned so much from that. So um, do you want to uh, just share a little bit of information about the coming workshop this year for people who are interested? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was pleased that uh, the people that attended it, which were advanced uh, traders in some cases, private traders, uh, sometimes they're money managers, but um, they were all pleased with uh, the information they received because I give a, a different look at the market. We started uh, with what the data looks like, and I go into um, the characteristics of, of the spectrum and, and how, why we approach it from a cycle point of view, as we've talked a little bit about today. Um, and, and I go from there into filter theory and go into um, uh, the transfer responses in general and Z transforms, which helps understand the kind of indicators that we make in trading. And this year I'm going to introduce a useful website called Micromodeler that helps people understand at, at an even deeper level what's going on on the filters from a digital signal processing point of view. And we'll talk about a whole lot of different filters and indicators. Um, a number of them I've published. I, I, uh, the super smoother and the roofing filter. I talk about automatic gain control so that we can swing our oscillators between minus one and plus one, which is always um, a, a nice thing to do because you can then use multipliers like Hilbert transforms on it uh, if its if its amplitude is constrained. And um, there are error correcting uh, codes um, and continuous. Um, error correcting techniques that I use that uh, are very useful. And I also go into all the different ways of measuring cycles, including um, I'm disclosing my MESA algorithm, which I only do in these workshops. I do not do it in publications other than that. And I compare it to direct Fourier transforms and autocorrelation periodograms, all these different ways of, of measuring. I show you what works and what doesn't work. Um, there's a variety of indicators. Swami charts will give you an overview. You can see the market from a 30,000 foot level and get a greater appreciation than putting indicators in context. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, on the third day of the workshop, we uh, go into actual uh, trading strategies. And I just close uh, my Mesa indicator, my, my Mesa phaser strategy, the Mesa intraday. I talk about a new signal to noise module that I've developed that will that can be applied to any trading strategy. You improve its results by only taking trades when the signal to noise ratio is adequate. And uh, I'll also disclose the code that I'm actually using in one of my uh, auto trading accounts. So it's going to be a f jam packed full three days. Yeah, the, the thing that I kind of took away from uh, last year's workshop is really that um, 
the, the way that you uh, look at the markets and especially through your DSP work and, and also your cycle stuff as well, there's, um, it's really quite unique. And I think these days there's so many people and uh, machines looking at the market and we're all kind of, uh, you know, if we're all looking at similar types of things, then, you know, it can get a bit tricky. But I think by looking at the uh, market and processing it in kind of unique ways can definitely give you an edge. So I think if anyone's, um, you know, interested, I'll, I'll put up a link on the show notes page and then people can find out some more information about the workshop and, and all the stuff you share because it uh, was really an awesome workshop. So I'll put that up on the show notes page. Um, now, uh, I'll just start wrapping up, John. So is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we finish up for today? Well, you know, I'd just like to amplify on, on what you just said. One of the comments that Bernie made as a result of last year's workshop, he said there were lots of aha moments. And that's, uh, you know, there will be some, some uh, mathematics involved, but also I'll be describing things in a way I think that are understandable and you can relate to them from your current experience. And so it's a way of uh, using what you already know to be a more effective trader. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us today, John. It was really interesting to um, speak to you about that and really great to hear about this new indicator that you're sharing. So I think everyone is going to appreciate that. So um, thanks again, and I wish you all the best. Okay, Andrew, thank you again for talking to me today. And I hope uh, lots of your listeners decide to join us at this year's workshop. I hope so too. Thanks, John. All the best. Bye for now. Bye. Okay, so if you want to get a download of that indicator or you want to know more about John Eller's workshop, then just head over to the show notes page, bettersystemtrader.com slash 103, that's slash 103, and you can find more info there. Enjoy. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Thank you.